All right, Dr. Tambe, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. I'm just checking the PPT. All right, let me check the audio meanwhile uh, at CASFOS. Am I audible at Dehradun and Coimbatore? Director WII, Dr. S.P. Yadav, IG Forest, RT Division, MOEFCC, Dr. Sunish Bakshi, and other senior officials of MOEFCC. Director FRI, Dr. Renu Singh, and heads of other organizations under ICFRE umbrella. Dean FRI, deemed to be university, Dr. Ginwal. DG FSI, Shri Anup Singh. Regional office head, MOEFCC, Shri Pankaj Agrawal. Faculty members of IGNFA. DFP Shri Anurag Bharadwaj, Principal Kasfos Dehradun, Ms. Minakshi Joshi, Principal Kasfos Koyamtur, V. Thru Navu Kurasu, and IFS Probationers of 21-23 Batch, SFS Induction Trainees of Dehradun and Koyamtur, including FRO Trainees. So today is today's lecture by our esteemed guest, Dr. Sandeep Tambe is a part of a series of lecture which have been organized by IGNFA so far. And the topic of today's lecture is a talk on science policy and practice interface. And we, today's lecture is a joint initiative of IGNFA and CASFOS as a part of Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav initiative. Talking about Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, which is, which is an initiative of government of India to celebrate and commemorate 75 years of independence and the glorious history of its people, culture and achievements. This Mahotsav is dedicated to the people of India who have not only been instrumental in bringing India thus far in its evolutionary journey, but also hold within them the power and potential to enable our Honorable Prime Minister's vision of activating India 2.0, fueled by the spirit of Atmanirbha Bharat. This official journey of ACOM commenced on 12th March 2021, which started a 75 weeks countdown towards 75th anniversary of independence and will end post a year, 15th August, 2023. And we know that one integral aspect of this Mahotsav is sustainable development. And in this regard, IG and FA has been organizing a series of lectures. Today, we are lucky to have among us Dr. Sandeep Tambe, IFS, and former professor, Indian Institute of Forest Management, Bhopal, to give a talk on science policy, practice interface, and illustrations with case studies on building sustainability in Eastern Himalayas. Now I would like to introduce our esteemed guest, Sandeep Tambeji. Sandeep Tambe is a member of Indian Forest Service and has diverse work, work experience, having worked in government, NGO and academic institutions. He served 16 years in Sikkim State in the forest and rural development sector. While in Sikkim, he contributed to securing wildlife areas in Kanchanjunga landscape, effective implementation of poverty elevation programs and in the revival of Himalayan spring using scientific and people-centric approaches. He has also contributed towards policy formulation for lake conservation, eco-development, tracking regulations, strengthening decentralized governance and effective social audits. He served in Indian Institute of Forest Management from 2015 to 2022 and taught courses related to natural resource management, forest policy and law, applied rural livelihoods, etc. He has also conducted executive training related to participatory approaches, project management, sustainable bamboo management and e-course titled Certificate course on chartered foresters and applied rural livelihoods. He graduated from the Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai, is a postgraduate in forestry from the Forest Research Institute and is a PhD from Wildlife Institute of India. He was selected as the top 25 persons of the year by the Forbes India magazine in 2010. He was conferred the TN Hoshu Memorial Award in 2012 and the State Award for Meritorious Service in 2014. The Livelihood Program, managed by him, won the Prime Minister's Award for Excellence in Public Administration in 2013 and National Awards for Excellence in Convergence and Transparency in 2015. In 2017, the Indian Institute of Forest Management Student Council selected him for the Best Teachers Award. He was also member of the seven-member Expert Committee constituted by the Supreme Court in 2021 on matters related to compensatory conservation of forest and trees. Now talking briefly about today's topic, that is 
a lecture on science policy and practice interface and illustrations with case studies on building sustainability in the eastern himalayas linking evidence to action as we know that the main problem of uh, main problem faced across the department is the silos that exist among the departments so we we are talking about this importance of this interface operating at the science policy and practice interface is often contentious as knowledge creators and end users seldom engage preferring to operate in their own worlds the application of science to solve sustainability challenges has not received the desired attention especially in the developing countries then how to strengthen the credibility relevance and legitimacy of research so as to enhance the chances of uptake in decision making how to generate knowledge differently so that it is more likely to bring about changes and benefit society the purpose of this research is to examine these question in the context of three sustainability case studies that were able to transcend the knowledge action barrier these case studies are often are from the global biodiversity hotspot of eastern himalaya and cover the themes of sustainability of pastoral systems promoting sustainable livelihood for the poor and co designing a himalayan spring revival initiative the findings are structured to highlight how the demand for science arose findings of the research and how the knowledge generated was translated into actions the result shows that firstly relevance of science increase manifold when aligned to prominent policy decisions and real world problems secondly secondly transdisciplinary studies that synthesize social economic and ecological aspects have a greater chance of influencing policy makers thirdly mediate mediation by science towards holds lots of promise in connecting the worlds of academicians and policy makers the study provides practical guidance on bridging the science policy interface and contribute to the growing body of literature on sustainability science so to talk in detail i would like to invite our esteemed guest dr sandeep tambe ji thank you so much uh, and a very good afternoon to uh, the dignitaries to the young minds who have joined today to all the participants it's really an honor to be a part of this uh, event and to share my journey of the last 25 years the ups and downs some failures some successes with all of you so that when you embark on your journey the young minds you will have some uh, you can say you can uh, build on these experiences that i'll share with you so uh, am i audible yes yes sir yes, yes. yeah thank you so uh, the main purpose of today's talk is uh, how do we develop evidence based policy evidence based practice something that builds on science and in today's world as we know as uh, india is embarking on enhancing its economic growth there are compulsions to create jobs there are compulsions to create employment Uh, there is a need to uh, further reduce poverty and there is a need to develop our infrastructure at the same time we have to preserve our natural capital our ecological infrastructure so that is the challenge that i guess all of us face uh, in our professional lives how do we ensure that we have economic growth at the same time we have uh, inclusive growth and at the same time we preserve our natural resources so this particular talk tries to bring in these elements of uh economics social science uh ecology uh and then we'll try to see how there are trade offs involved and how do we take decisions so that is the purpose of today's talk especially uh, targeted towards the young minds wherein uh, i'll try to share some of the case studies wherein i will try to show how important role science plays uh, and the typical perception that we have that uh science is not very critical for decision making but uh, let me just point out that most of the sustainability challenges that you will face in field will be very complex because the easy challenges the simple problems my generation has already solved so we have left all those difficult challenges complex challenges wicked problems for your generation and these challenges are really complex they will require a deeper analysis a uh, multi sectoral approach it will require trade offs will be involved and it will your activities will be assessed not just on one indicator but multiple indicators so these are complex times for all of us and let me start by sharing my presentation and as we move ahead in case you want to ask something you are most welcome so i'll try to keep my talk within 60 minutes then we will have another 30 minutes for detailed interaction
so is the slide visible now yes sir yes it is yeah thank you so uh, the focus on the talk is it's based geographically in the eastern himalaya which includes uh, sikkim it includes bhutan it includes eastern nepal parts of arunachal pradesh and it is a part of the himalayan biodiversity hotspot so the title is bridging the science policy and practice so what we want to essentially say here that these three elements need to be integrated when we talk of sustainability assessment or sustainable development so how to go about doing it so we try to uh, focus on some of my life experiences so i became a dfo in uh, 2000 in the year 2000 around 22 years back so most of the challenges that my generation faced were reserved were basically local challenges the depend over dependence of local communities uh, in terms of the biomass so you can talk think of it in terms of firewood collection for the uh, uh, in terms of uh, destructive harvesting for ntfp etc so it was basically we engaged with local communities to secure our protected areas and we also in that time faced challenges which development brings with it whether it is infrastructure development in the form of roads big hydel projects, big tourism projects. So these projects are actually uh, initiated by the state government as a development intervention. So how do we still preserve our protected areas uh, from getting fragmented? So these were also some challenges that my generation faced and I'm sure your generation will face this more and more. But one challenge that we didn't face much during our times in the field are global challenges. That is challenges where as a field person, you can only adapt you can only build resilience, but you can't do much about mitigation. So, so and these challenges, you sometimes feel helpless that how do I stop the very cause of this problem? So you are essentially always adapting to it. You are trying to build resilience, but there's not much you can do as an individual at the local level to actually address these global challenges of global warming, climate change, etc. And these challenges are increasingly playing out in our natural landscape. So uh, my generation essentially tried to solve many of these local challenges. Some of the state challenges also we try to address, but your generation will increasingly face more and more of these state challenges and global challenges, which you have to address. And these are really complex problems as we come to it. So uh, as I uh, have coined this, there is a national sustainability challenge that all of us, you, all of you will face when you go to the uh, district level and below. So as we all know, India is amongst the fastest growing regions of the world and sustainability challenge is what we all, the country will face in terms of having high economic growth, creating jobs, reducing poverty, at the same time, preserving its natural capital. So this is one of the biggest challenges that all of you will face in the field. So what uh, essentially is needed in this particular situation is, uh, you will come across these problems in your day to day life. So in the districts that you're posted in, you will find some river which is drying up, which is very polluted. You will have to grapple with issues of severe air pollution. There might be a loss of biodiversity in some of your key areas. Forest fires might be more intensive. Forest fires might uh, ascend also in Himalayan terrain. There might be excessive use of groundwater. There might be more and more uh, use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers in the agriculture landscape urban landscapes will become more and more congested. These are the sustainability challenges that I guess every district of the country is facing. And as forest officers, we have the advantage of having a scientific background. And, our, and with our expertise, we are best placed to contribute in developing solutions to these real world sustainability challenges. So uh, how I would like to position uh, your careers would be to look upon yourself as professionals who would be delivering real world solutions of sustainability in the real world. Or to put it in another way, I would like to position you more as sustainability managers who would be able to provide workable solutions to real world sustainability challenges. And here you have to look at the same issue from different dimensions. So what is the challenge we face? Why is it that we are not able to preserve our natural capital in the face of these challenges from state-led development initiatives and global changes? So one of the main reasons is that typically science, policy and practice, these three key elements and components are not integrated 
when we take our decisions so this purpose of this talk is to take you through this particular journey wherein we show that how important it is how important it is to build in evidence in our day to day decision making and often we become a bit prejudiced as professionals when we look down upon science we feel that scientists live in their own world they have their own universe their focus is on publishing research papers they don't really tackle real world problems and in a way we kind of don't use the expertise of research and science and knowledge in our decision making so so this is what i wanted to highlight so this sustainability challenge is what you will face and i will try to share some experiences some tools some models which might be of use to you so in all most of the developing countries more so in india science and policy science is the world of academicians universities research institutes uh, training institutes that is basically the world of science and training while policy makers are mostly people who are taking decisions at the local level at the state level at the national level they shape policy or they make policy and typically in developing countries these two key stakeholders the academic world and the development world or the policy makers they live in different universes there is very less interaction amongst them and that is especially unfortunate because when we have to tackle complex sustainability challenges there is a need for these two worlds to intersect to talk with each other and communicate then only the solutions will emerge so there is a need for integration and there is a need for intersectoral approach so we have to look at the social dimension economic dimension ecological dimension weigh the pros and cons of different decisions before taking them so so then this is what brings in a demand for professionals who have a scientific background who can provide workable solutions to this real world sustainability challenges so that is what i wanted to highlight so how i plan to structure my talk is i will present what is SPPI or science policy practice interface then there is a framework known as the creely framework which we will try to study and understand because this framework or model actually helps us to bridge this universe of science policy and practice and then we will go through the three case studies on pastoral systems on rural livelihoods and on himalayan springs and then we will try to see what are the lessons that we can draw from them this is the structure of the talk so let us go from the first step that what is this science policy practice interface so this is the the connecting link that links evidence or knowledge to policy making and then implementing the policy on the ground and impacting the stakeholders who are there so this whole link or this bridge is known as the science policy practice to give you an example uh, d- uh, during the uh, uh, early uh, 21st century during or late or uh, 20th century there was this huge crisis of uh, vulture mass deaths in india so the vulture population declined by more than 90% just in a decade so while we were trying to struggling to find out what could be the possible reason finally science brought the solution that it is because of a drug called diclofenac which is used in veterinary science which is the cause of this crisis in vulture and the massive decline in their population so once science came up with that solution then the uh, ministry of environment and ministry of health they joined hands and they discussed with other stakeholders and then this drug was banned and once this drug was banned the drug was it was enforced by the state agencies so this is a good example of a problem that was faced by society of a rapid decline in vulture population how science came up with a solution that this is the cause of it and then how policy then adopted that solution and then they could actually implement it on the ground so so that is how these complex environmental problems can get addressed if all stakeholders join hands academicians policy makers and practitioners so this is this vulture crisis is a good example of that so but what typically happens in the real world these are some of the success stories that i talked of but often what happens is policy makers are interested in research that can create solutions to problems so policy makers are always grappling with problems whether it is human animal conflict whether it is drying water sources ground water depleting biodiversity loss so they want solutions to these problems and what happens is the researchers when they are working they actually have their own research interest and they don't really have the interest of policy makers in their mind when they design their research projects 
and what are the outputs of research the outputs of research are seminars journal papers conferences you might have heard of so many of them but they actually that kind of communication has little bearing to support policy makers and often academicians do uh, research that is very focused it has a narrow geographical scope and what policy makers want is okay so what is the performance of let's say the uh, the plantations program taken up under the green india mission so i would like to have an assessment of that based on that i would like to change my policy so there would be very few researchers who would have done a research on green india mission with a national scope probably they would have covered one state one district but for policy makers they want studies with a larger scope and taken up in less period of time typically research takes 2 years 3 years policy makers want results within 6 months so that is where the disconnect happens in terms of the uh, the scope of the study in terms of the geographical area in terms of the time frame of the study and often we feel as academicians that our research should be given primacy in decision making often it doesn't happen and uh, other factors like financial constraints or maybe the the political uh, uh, commitments in the manifesto or maybe the social impacts they might overweigh the role of science in decision making so that is what i wanted to highlight and as policy makers what are the mistakes that we do so what are the mistakes we do as policy makers typically we have a i just wanted to describe the world of policy makers how it is different from that of academicians so they tend to have a very short term perspective there is some problem they have to solve so they want solutions quickly and often there is a political uh, you can say uh, exigency that they have to resolve there is something which is has to be urgently done so they want quick uh, sharing of knowledge second is they want everything to be summarized in one page because they have to make a note for the policy makers so if a researcher gives a 200 page document to a policy maker he will find it very very confusing and difficult to use so he will say that give me something which i can use readily and they would like research which is which can be directly implemented so that is what i just wanted to highlight that typically if you ask policy makers about scientists they will say that they live in their own world they do research for their research interests their main interest is to take out publications and they are too slow they are too expensive they work on questions which we have not asked so this is what creates that divide between policy makers and researchers and this is the divide that has to be bridged if india has to tackle the sustainability challenges that it faces so so these are the two different worlds that i wanted you to understand so that when you work at the interface you realize the the how they operate what are their reward structures what are their time frames and what are their motivation so that we need to understand when we are operating at the interface so after giving you an quick introduction about the science policy practice interface let us come to the framework or the model that i was discussing this is known as the creeley framework so it was given by cash et al in a paper in science magazine and the cr stands for credibility the re stands for relevance and le stands for legitimacy so they go on to say that sometimes science is able to translate into action some science is not able to translate into action so what are the reasons why some science is only able to bridge the knowledge action divide so they developed this framework or model known as creeley and they said that any research or any knowledge creation if it is able to strengthen the credibility the relevance and the legitimacy there is a greater chance that it will be able to impact policy and practice so whenever you are working at the interface you need to strengthen these three things the credibility of the knowledge the relevance of the knowledge and the legitimacy if you can do that there is a greater chance that that knowledge will impact policy and practice so i'll share some of the experiences from my uh, career so what is credibility credibility is how good is your science is it a uh, uh, can it withstand scrutiny is it technically sound that is all about credibility how good is your science relevance of knowledge means how much does it align with the requirements of policy makers so if you are working in agriculture if you position your research saying that this will help in doubling farmers income or it will result in more crop per drop then there then you are making your research relevant because you are aligning with the national policy that is relevance and third is legitimacy that is 
the knowledge created, how much ownership is there from the stakeholders. This is very important. For example, as a uh, government official, if a researcher comes to me, what is the first question I will ask? I will ask, okay, you have come uh, from uh, so-and-so place. So which organization you belong to? Which is your institute? So what I am actually trying to ascertain is the legitimacy of that particular person or that researcher. So legitimacy is very important. Which organization you are working with is very important. And uh, the credibility that you will draw will be drawn from first. It will come from the organization you are working with. So credibility of research, relevance and legitimacy are the three buzzwords when we talk of science policy practice interface. So let us now go on to the three case studies that I talked of so that it doesn't become too boring at the beginning. So the first case study is about co-producing. The first word is co-producing sustainable pastoral management in the Sikkim Himalaya. So as you know, Sikkim is a mountain state in the Eastern Himalaya. It is blessed with very beautiful natural landscape, very beautiful biodiversity rich forests. But these forests also face a lot of threats. And as I said, during my time, it was biomass based local threats that we tried to tackle. So, uh, so the uh, most beautiful or most uh, uh, visited part of this particular beautiful state is the Kanchenjunga National Park, which is the highest national park in the country, third highest in the world. It houses Kanchenjunga, which is a guardian deity of this particular state. And just like Western Himalaya, uh, you have, uh, it is a pilgrimage site for Hindus. Uh, Sikkim Himalaya is a pilgrimage site for Buddhist and almost every mountain top has got a monastery and a Chorten and the whole landscape is considered sacred. So this is the Kanchenjunga National Park. And it is inhabited by diverse communities. Limbus are there, Lepchas are the indigenous people, Tibetan Dokpa are the herders, Bhutias were the business people and the herders. Gurungs were the shepherds, very diverse kind of ethnic mix of people stay adjacent to the national park. So I will now come to the issue straight away. So uh, the, uh, the forests of Sikkim, unlike the other states in the northeast, were actually surveyed in 1909 by the then king of Sikkim. And all the rights and concessions were settled and reserve forests were demarcated in 1914 by the then king of Sikkim, who is known as the Chogyal and protected forests were set aside to meet the needs of the local people. So all our forests are actually demarcated and they are settled in terms of rights and concessions. And on the basis of this, the government of Sikkim in 1996, the chief minister at that time took a policy decision that we need to ban grazing in the reserve forests in south and west districts of the state, which is nearly half the state and in plantation areas and in water sources. And this was the policy decision taken at the highest level and the forest department was asked to implement it. So when the forest department started implementing it, all the herders formed an association and they went to the high court against this policy decision saying that it infringes on their livelihood rights. So uh, at that time, the Sikkim high court actually reaffirmed the grazing ban of the state government saying that it is as per the provisions of the existing act and that this reserve forest are anyway free from rights and concessions. They were settled in 1909. So in their judgment dated 1999, the High Court of Sikkim provided a reaffirmation to the decision of the state government to ban grazing in the reserve forest. So uh, after this, we were uh, posted as the divisional forest officers. Uh, I was the DFO wildlife for South and West Sikkim. So we were given this policy instruction that we have to remove and ban grazing and we need to implement this policy on the ground and convert it into practice. So this is what the grazing looks like in the Sikkim Himalaya. So the herders go into the forest, they make a temporary shed and then you can see the lopping that happens in the oak forest and typically around two to three acres of land is cleared so that the cattle and the herder can stay there. But these are not like the nomadic herders. These households have got a, a, a house in the village below they have agriculture land. So this is an additional source of income which they are trying to follow. And for six months in a year, they stay here. In winter, they come back when the fields are fallow and their cattle stay in the agriculture field. So for six months, they stay in the forest and the forest uh, gets fragmented in this manner because of lopping and because of clearing. And also they create a lot of disturbance. 
so there was a study that was done by indian institute of remote sensing so this is where knowledge comes in that i talked of the evidence so dr kushwa was there in indian institute of remote sensing that time and he did this study and this study actually showed the level of fragmentation that was happening in our sanctuaries so you can see all these red polygons these are the areas which have very high fragmentation so so that time when we did a survey we found there were more than 300 cattle sheds and uh, on an average there were 20 cattle in each cattle shed so 6000 cattle and some of the tourists who visited this sanctuary they told me that is it a cattle sanctuary or is it a wildlife sanctuary so that was the situation in 1999 and all the water sources for the villages below uh, there are more than uh, uh, around 20 to 30 gram panchas adjacent to this particular sanctuary their water sources were all in these forest areas and this is what had prompted the state government to say that we need to protect the forest ban grazing so that water security is ensured so uh, so this was the situation so let me ask a few questions so that it doesn't remain a monologue so let's uh, imagine especially it is targeted to our professionals so you are uh, the dfo here and uh, you see this kind of massive grazing that is happening in the sanctuary and uh, there is a policy decision that we need to remove this cattle from the forest so how would you approach this problem you have full political backing and political will and it is, there is this problem in front of you how would you approach it anyone would like to answer or give your opinion please please go ahead Hello. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Maybe uh, we can create a buffer zone around the forest and uh, um, uh, some area grazing ground for the uh, cattle and not inside the forest, core forest. Okay, so get the forest to the, get the cattle into the protected forest and try to preserve the reserve forest. Yes. Okay, 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 very good. Anyone else? Sir, though we have the uh, uh, great political backing, uh, one would be uh, inclined to enforce a ban, an outright ban, but that would alienate the local community. So one of the ways would be to, uh, to because it's known that they are the forests are the water sources, so to create a sense of ownership, even amongst these uh, communities, the herder community, and try to convince them bit by bit and also rationalize the red spots that we see on the map. So probably that would be an incremental approach which would uh, create lesser antagonism to the approach. Okay, very good. Create uh, this value amongst the community that uh, we are, this ban will help you in the long run because we are trying to preserve the water resources and finally you are going to benefit out of this ban. Very good. And we don't want to alienate the community because they are finally the long-term guardians of this protected area anyone else look at it from the social angle also anyone else yes sir yeah go ahead so before targeting this all areas uh, i think uh, some of the uh, areas like on pilot basis may be selected in one go uh, in that i think uh, confidence building measures uh, should be taken with the community with again uh, focusing on their uh, the alternative livelihood of the people who are based on this particular. So if it is a pilot basis success, I succeed in the first experiment, we can extend in holistic whole park. Otherwise, alternative methodology may be adopted. Oh, very good, very good. Now, I was not smart as all of you in that time. And actually, you know, I didn't do the pilot, which I think would have been a very good idea now that I think of it. So, like I say, the younger generation is much more capable uh, to tackle these complex problems. So, let me just go through now uh, what uh, we tried to do at that time. So, uh, like I said, this is a unique situation. You won't get it in another state. You have got strong political will backing you. Government has decided before the forest department that grazing has to be banned. And forest department is being told that you remove the cattle from the forest. So, this situation is unique to the state. Typically, it wouldn't be like that. Typically, the forest department would like to remove the cattle and the political will would be actually no opposing it. So this is a different kind of situation that I faced. So uh, first thing that I did, like many of you have said, we had a consultation workshop with the herders. 
so we told them that our hands are tied this is the decision at the highest level from the chief minister of the state and these cattle have to be removed now we don't have a choice it and it is uh, illegal as per the wildlife protection act you are causing destruction to habitat section 29 and then uh, your lopping of trees etc would also be construed as destruction of habitat people staying inside the sanctuary the herders without taking permits entry pass all that is illegal we, and and we told them this is not a traditional activity because in 1909 these forests were set aside as reserve forests you have been doing it last few decades but it's not really something which is traditional and these herders also knew that they had lost the case in the high court so the herder said that sir this is actually uh, one of the livelihoods that we practice and uh, it is not that we are solely dependent on herding it is something which one of the family member does so but taking this cattle to our uh, agricultural field is not possible there is no fodder available to take care of 20 cattle so they said that you provide us some compensation and with that we will try to uh, buy a better quality of cattle and we will sell off these cattle and we will try to ensure that our livelihood doesn't get affected too much so that was a very good kind of consultation we had and it was possible because of the political will and the legal backing that we had so after this consultation uh, we realized that that time we used to have central sector schemes and most of the money used to be that time uh, when i was there used to go for uh, making trekking trails, making footpaths, making wash towers, water holes, etc. So we thought that and plantations also. So when there are so many cattle inside the sanctuary, there was no point making those plantations. So we thought that let's change our uh, the APO as we called it or the uh, plan for getting resources. And in our sanctuary conservation plan, we said that let's just keep money for compensating the herders so that for uh, these herders, we will be able to have substantial resources so that we can compensate them. So that was how the process that we followed. And another thing that we did was we realized that these herder families were oh, less than 10% of the total households adjacent to the sanctuary. So it is not that every family is a herder, only 10% are herders. So the remaining 90%, we organized them village wise into eco development committees. So we got those 90% households supporting us, supporting the cause of conservation, supporting the cause of water resource preservation, supporting the cause of future ecotourism benefits. And then we, when we got the support of 90% of the rural community, we got some social backing. We had political backing, we had legal backing, we didn't have social backing. So when we created this eco development committees, it created a social force in the village that these are natural resources, is a common pool resource, it has to be shared with everyone. Why should only few people destroy this resource for their personal benefit and other people are actually facing the consequences. So these eco-development committees played the role of actually putting a social pressure on these herder families that you are actually destroying the future which will affect all of us. And finally we got thanks to Ministry of Environment and Forest we got those compensation schemes as part of our annual plan and we could distribute all these uh, support uh, of 10,000 rupees per herder in 2000. It was a bit of money. And then uh, these, eco these people whom you see are the eco development committee members. They distributed it to the herders who had voluntarily removed their cattle. So it made a big impact. And they were happy, we were happy, government's policy got implemented. And the main reason why it got implemented was people's power through the eco development committees, and which gave us support to actually enforce. Uh, it at the village level uh, but at the same time as you know when you are working at the village level all households are not the same so there were few households who were very powerful who actually belonged to some bureaucrats and they did not agree to our policy so actually in some cases we had to actually enforce the law of uh, destroying the cattle shed burning it and then telling them that this is against the law so sometimes you have to do that as well but as long as the majority is with you you can afford to do that so because of that, the, the grazing numbers, the number of cattle came down from nearly 6,000 to uh, less than 500 in a matter of five years. But it took us around three to four years of non-stop effort working at the village level and trying to convince the people that this is something which is actually impacting them and their families in the long run. So if you cattle are removed from the forest, 
it is going to benefit them and not us the forest department so this is how that social mobilization happened so just wanted to highlight that uh, the role that communities can play in enforcing uh, government policy if you partner with them if we had not partnered with the villagers if we had not formed those eco development committees there was no way we would have been able to bring about this big change because people were with us and we had political backing and the laws were favoring us uh, we could bring about this change but the main driver was the local community and after that it's 20 years now since this has happened and still our forests are cattle free main reason was that community mobilization and awareness and people realizing that they are actually guardians of this sanctuary and they can actually ensure that this sanctuary remains pristine and it can be a future source of water security ecotourism for them in the long run so this is how this particular thing played out so there is another section to this story which i will skip right now because we have to keep track of time so let me go to the second story now before that sandeep yeah you are you are allowed to continue for 5 years that itself is a big deal uh, can you repeat that sir no no you were allowed to continue for 5 years from 2000 to 2005 that is also a factor uh, yeah that is a factor sir no doubt <laughs> that is a big factor normally uh, we have postings of 2 to 3 years so i was lucky sir i was posted there from 99 to 2003 for 4 years and during that 4 year we could successfully complete it and the P and the officers who came after me they could also continue it but but the main people who actually are driving it after that are the local committees and the eco development committees that is true sir so i'll go to the next part now the second part of the story so like i said uh, there was participatory enforcement and because of that most of these cattle sheds got dismantled the ones who were not agreeing uh, this action could take place so now we go on to the second story that i was talking of so after this because of this conservation that happened in south and west sikkim in our sanctuaries and national park so this actually helped in the kanchenjunga national park becoming more pristine becoming rewilding it and it got inscribed in 2016 as the unesco world heritage site also so this was also one of the outcomes of rewilding this landscape and uh, having a community based conservation in this particular landscape because before this there were these stories that if you remove cattle from forest like you hear about it in valley of flowers many other polygonum and other species will become invasive and your ecosystem will get destroyed you hear about the stories of bharatpur also that certain species will suddenly uh, explode and your ecosystem will get destroyed but in the case of sikkim our oak forests which were fragmented have come back with lot of vigor and our forests which were fragmented are all dense forests now so that is what we observed in eastern himalaya so now we move on to the second story so this is about rural development rural livelihoods something that you will come across a lot in your professional careers so at that time i was actually uh, after my stint in wildlife uh, the uh, local political leaders felt that this this boy goes to villages so often and he has this connect with the local people let's post him in rural development and at that time i had just completed my phd from wildlife institute of india i was so unhappy that i have to now work in rural livelihoods but that is how it's a professional hazard so i thought okay let's try to do something uh, for the poor people of the state so uh, so this story uh, is from the livelihood sector in the state of sikkim so when i started working in rural development there was this program called manrega you might have heard of it it was recently launched in 2006 uh, and then i was asked to manage this program and the purpose of this program is how is to provide 100 days of unskilled wage employment to every rural household who is demanding it so when we talked of rural livelihoods in the state of sikkim Uh, there are certain perceptions like i said science and knowledge often don't engage strongly with policy makers so what was the perception that policy makers had before this initiative so sikkim was a poor state those days the poverty levels the bpl were 31% and government had recently launched a mission poverty free sikkim in 2010 to make the state poverty free and the perception of senior officers during those days was that why are the poor people lazy so you should ask that question and see the responses you get so the responses i got in rural development department was these people are lazy that is why they are poor they are alcoholic that is why they are poor they are satisfied they don't want to grow in life 
that is why they are poor so so that actually implies that the department doesn't need to do anything because these people are poor because of their own karma and not because of some drawback from the programs that we are implementing so this was the perception it is there in uh, in a majority of the states so uh, so we thought let's do a in house study so we engaged some of the best minds and we did a study to ascertain where are the poor people in sikkim why they are poor where are they located and what interventions are needed so the study had these key questions that it tried to answer who are the poor people where they are located what is the reason they are poor what we can do for them so that study actually threw up very unique uh, findings so this study told us that the poor were mostly poor not because they were lazy alcoholic or satisfied but because they had very less livelihood assets they were mostly landless they lived in kachcha houses and labor work agricultural labor work was their main source of income so that is why they were poor so lack of livelihood asset was the main reason why the people were poor in the state they were mostly landless and near landless people they used to work in other people's agricultural fields and get some part time income because agriculture is not a full time activity you get work part time during planting weeding harvesting etc most of the time they were unemployed so that was the main reason why those people were poor so then we realized also that the main source of funds that we had to make an intervention was manrega and manrega that time was creating mostly public assets in the village like footpaths playgrounds uh, drainage works big irrigation canals so manrega was investing in large scale civil works and the people who were poor were not able to benefit other than getting wage employment so we thought was thought what we thought was how can we restructure this program so that it can create assets for the poorest in the village instead of creating just footpaths and playgrounds can we also create some livelihood assets in the lands of the poor so that is how we thought we can embed this research or this science into policy and practice so that was the challenge we faced so how we went about doing it we organized this village planning exercises so in every village we had these plans prepared first step in that plan was who are the 20% poorest people in your village so you do that using a tool known as participatory wellbeing ranking so i'm sure you must have uh, you must be aware of that so using participatory wellbeing ranking we found out the 20% poorest people in that particular village then that time my rural development minister was very talented he told me tambe let's do sort analysis at the household level let's not do it at the village level let's do it at the household level for this 20% poorest people let's find out why they are poor what assets they lack what are their strengths what are their weaknesses what we can do for them he said don't do it at the village level like they do do it at the household level because it varies from household to household so it was a very challenging exercise to do a sort analysis for 20% of the poorest households for the whole state but actually we did we started on it on a pilot basis like the idea we got so we selected around 50 gram panchayats and then this is an example for you like the first person rangalal chetri his strength is he has got housing support from indira awas yojana his main source of income is agriculture labor he gets the subsidized rice from government under the national food security act and since he has a, a very less land and it is very steep his main source of income is from raising goat and pig what is his weakness he has very less land holding he has a large family most of the land that he owns is very steep you know in mountain area sloping lands are there and there is no water for irrigation so then what narega can provide it can provide a water storage tank uh, the steep land can be terraced under land development and narega can build a pig shelter and a goat shelter so that he can do his animal rearing more professionally then the next person uh, he is purna bahadur uh, he is a scheduled caste family he also has very little land and he does work in manrega and he also does animal rearing so what we realized was as i said earlier the study told us that the poorest people are landless or near landless so what kind of livelihood assets can you build for them so we realized that landless and near landless people depend mostly on small animal rearing whether it's pigs whether it is goats so we try to develop goat sheds animal sheds water tanks for them so that it could supplement their livelihoods 
So this is how we did SWOT analysis at the household level so that we could exactly pinpoint what interventions will be most suitable for that household. So this is a water tank that you see it is 10,000 liters costing around 70,000 rupees in that in those days. So it enabled the particular household to take up vegetable farming and also water security. So this way, so instead of making big footpaths, big playgrounds, we started investing in creating assets in the lands of the poorest people so that they could get another source of income. It could strengthen their existing livelihood. One, uh, one question, Sandeep. Please, please go ahead. Yes. The thing is, uh, when the Mandrega was introduced, it was only talking about the uh, the common assets. No, how we are able to tweak into these uh, individual assets? Do you have yeah, any amendments in your state? Or? Yeah. yeah, sir. From 2010 onwards, the Mandrega uh, guidelines were amended, and it allowed us to take up these uh, assets at the household level. Not for all households, but for BPL households, Indira Avas, Yojana beneficiaries, SCST households, you could take it up. So 2010 onwards, the guidelines were amended, which enabled this to be done. And these national guidelines were amended, so it is applicable for all the states. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this is about uh, the large cardamom, which is the main cash crop of the state. So large cardamom plantations we could take up, then uh, orange plantations we could take up. Uh, and these are some of the results of that crop and but the major investment was in animal sheds because the as I said the poorest were near landless or landless and their main income was from rearing animals and this is how the traditional pigs were kept so after that we made them uh, these pig ties were built at the village level and uh, this was a very big program so it covered nearly 60-70% uh, of the households of the whole state within five years. So within five years, the whole state was almost saturated with this household livelihood assets. And then we had very strong social audits wherein the total expenditure that was made was actually read out in the Gram Sabha that for making this cattle shed, the department has bought 30 bags of cement of Birla company at the rate of 250 rupees per bag. So the women would actually uh, check and counter check this public expenditure. It's known as social audit. I found it the most effective tool for countering corruption in the country because this is what makes the program and the functionaries accountable to the people otherwise they are only accountable to their higher ups so when these things got read out the women said no no only 25 bags of cement came that bill is not correct those five bags of cement never reached us and it was not birla variety it was some local variety so that was not good quality so all those issues came up and then there was on the spot recovery was made from the functionaries and it helped in making the program accountable to the people. If anyone wants to reduce corruption, I feel social audit, if you do it properly and you can empower the people, give them a platform where they feel that there is no risk for them, their voice is going to be heard, it makes a big difference. Because finally the facts and figures are with the people. Only they know how many bags of cement, what quality, when it reached, they are the only ones who know. Otherwise other things are only on paper. This made a huge impact. People felt empowered. And how it changed our program was instead of our household level livelihood assets, our investment was only 10% before that. It rose up to 52%. So 52% of our investment went to household level livelihood assets and public infrastructure. We still continue to make it, but it went down to 30% from 64%. So instead of focusing only on large assets, we started also creating household level assets which helped the poor people to come out of poverty. Otherwise, they were only working as laborers in these large infrastructure projects. So here they got wages when the assets were built and they also got the asset. So it was like a double income for them. Wages plus an asset through which they could get more incomes. So this program made a huge impact and it was showcased also and many uh, national guidelines and national planning also got influenced by this program. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of this happened because the studies that we did in the beginning to find out who are the poor people, why they are poor, where they are located in Sikkim, what we can do for them. So I think that actually created an understanding as to how we need to restructure our program so that it starts focusing on creating assets in the lands of the poor. And the perception that was there before that because evidence or knowledge was not impacting policy. It was that poor people are poor because they are lazy, they don't want to work, they are satisfied with whatever they have that was found to be totally wrong 
and our study showed that it is because they didn't have assets they didn't have employment they were really poor so this program really helped and sikkim actually came up very fast so within i think 10 years our poverty levels not only because of this program other programs also contributed poverty levels in sikkim came down to 5% it was amongst the those few states who could reduce their poverty from 30% to 5% within a decade so this program really contributed in a big way so uh, what i wanted to highlight here is the role that knowledge science studies can play in actually impacting the way you design your programs and you implement them so with that we go to the last case study i'll just skip this part i've already told this so uh, this particular initiative uh, was actually acknowledged by ministry of rural development and it gave lot of recognition to a state because typically when you think of northeast you think that these places administration is weak government programs don't get implemented well it's there is high corruption this program actually helped to change that perception that very good programs can also be implemented with very low corruption levels and which are actually very meaningful in creating sustainable livelihoods for the rural people so this was the experience we had and here also like uh, sir was saying i was lucky to be posted there for 8 years non stop so that really helped me to first understand then think about the change that is needed bring about the change and also see the results so this is very rare that i could stay in one posting for 8 years to understand then uh, conceptualize implement and then to measure the change so that i think is a blessing that i had so i could actually uh, bring about this change along with my team so then we go on to the third case uh, which we implemented while i was in rural development itself so this was sometime in february 2008 when uh, we were having celebrating the world water day and uh, many of these rural women were there amongst the participants and the horticulture department was explaining to them that these are the new varieties you can plant and this can give you better results and all that so after that big talk the women one of the women i remember she was from south sikkim she came to the stage and she said ki uh, don't really we don't really need new varieties or new crops our main problem is water if you can ensure water other things we know how to take care of it our biggest constraint is water we don't have even water for drinking let aside farming so she said that was the main difficulty we are facing if you can do something about it it will make a big difference that is our main requirement so that is how in this case the problem emanated from a from the field and we realized that uh, this was the problem that was being faced in the rural areas so we asked her what is the reason why there is no water she said that earlier there used to be lot of springs in my village springs are like we call them dhara here uh in uh, kashmir we call them chashma and in uttarakhand himachal uh, uh, we call them nola so these springs are actually the only source of drinking water in the middles of the himalaya there are these glaciers they are high up there are these big rivers they flow many kilometers down but in the middles of the himalaya where the people stay springs are the only source of water and she said that these springs were perennial earlier they are drying up so something needs to be done so this was the third problem that we faced and this is how a typical village in sikkim looks like you can see it is scattered it is not that you the typical village you would see in a mainland where all households are together so this is the challenge for rural development in sikkim because you have to provision water electricity connectivity sanitation to all these scattered households and then what you see in red color uh, are the springs and they become smaller and smaller as winter approaches and as summer comes so these springs which are higher up would dry up so this spring that you see on the top of the hill will dry up and because of that the people staying on the top of the hills have to come down and they have to actually carry water on their backs and take it up the hill to their to their houses and if there is water in the spring you get tap water because there is a water supply scheme there but if the water in the spring dries up then the villagers in the upper hills have no option but to go down to the spring below collect water carry it up hill so this was the huge uh, difficulty that women and children were facing because it was they who used to provision water for the household and then when we uh, tried to address this problem we couldn't find any example in any other state 
who had tried to resolve this issue. So again, I will probably you know, extend my talk by a few minutes if I have some permission. Uh, I would like to throw this question to the uh, young participants that in this situation, wherein you see that springs are drying up and uh, it is causing so much of difficulty for the women and it is the only source of water and you don't see any similar scheme in any other state, how would you approach this problem? It is a problem that has come from practice, from the water users. You are a policy maker, you are a policy shaper. So you have program funds, but you don't know what to do. So how will you approach this problem where there is no solution in front of you? Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, please go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, we can do like check dams and chalkhal in the uh, period of monsoon and some rain water harvesting schemes during the monsoon season when there is uh, plenty of water is available. So that the water scarcity during the winter and summer season can be uh, mitigated or can be. Uh... Okay, so you are saying rainwater harvesting. Yes, sir. So that the rainwater goes down and it recharges. Yes, sir. We can do that like in the Ladakh, they are doing the glaciers at the time of uh, making the artificial glaciers like schemes. Exactly. Yeah. So same kind of uh, things we can do also in such areas. Okay, very good, very good. So that is how we also started. We Because in academy, we had learned about watershed. So we thought, let's try with watershed approach and probably our springs will get recharged. And uh, we were actually wrong. Because springs are fed from groundwater and not from surface water. When we do watershed programs, we are actually trying to reduce the surface runoff and uh, the loss of soil. And we are trying to regulate the surface flow of water. Here, what we need is, you are right in a sense that that surface flow needs to be converted into groundwater. But at the same time, springs are nothing but groundwater that is coming out. So how does groundwater flow? And how can we increase the discharge of the spring? So where we need to do the watershed works. So that was some questions in our mind. So that was the knowledge gap. Can the mountain springs be revived? In 2008, there was hardly any knowledge available, even in science. And what is the source of spring water? Uh, will watershed approach work, like you said? Uh, and then we came across, so one way to approach a problem is to see whether there are some experiences, some pilots, some studies that have been conducted in the country or outside. So we did a literature review and a search to find out whether Nepal, Bhutan or Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Jammu Kashmir, whether they have done some kind of these studies, they have some programs, we tried to find that out. So we found only one research publication of Jibipan Institute of Himalayan Environment by Dr. Varun Jeev Joshi and GCS Negi and they had done a pilot and they in that small research pilot they had shown that if you can identify the recharge area of the spring from where the water is entering the ground and feeding the spring and you do some recharge works there your springs can in, discharge can increase. So there was only one study and luckily Dr. Varun Joshi was that time posted in Sikkim in Gangtok. So we were very lucky, we got him and we told him, we read your publication, we got this problem from the ground, you are the academician, you are the scientist, please guide us. So he helped us in developing a policy, or we called it Dhara Vikas, how you can develop your spring. And that actually really helped us to make a quick beginning. Then for building capacity of our uh, team members, we took support of science-based NGOs, like People Science Institute was there, WWF was there, there is a very good organization that focuses just on groundwater in Pune, known as Aquadam. They said, please send your staff, we will train them on how to increase the groundwater recharge. So, so this is how we actually started an experiment. There was, there was some research, but there were no, that the research was not translated into a program in any part of the world. So that was the challenge we faced. How do we convert science into a program by first making a policy and implementing it? So first step we did was we tried to identify which are the vulnerable villages in Sikkim where there is water scarcity, which we can prioritize for our program. So doing a vulnerability assessment, we figured out that the South Sikkim villages, which were in the rain shadow of the Darjeeling Himalaya, from where those women had come for our program, they are the ones who face maximum water, sec water insecurity. And then uh, the NGO friends and uh, GB Pant Institute advised us, you do an assessment of the resource. So prepare a spring atlas so we then bought a lot of GPS. In those days, there were no smartphones. 
and we send our field people to the field. They did a mapping of the springs. They found out how much is the discharge, how much it has reduced over the last 10 years, in which land holding the spring is, what is the land use above it, who are the owners. So we did that kind of an assessment. So in South District, we prepared a spring atlas to understand the resource better. And then for every village, we try to prepare a village security plan so that you can see this is a village. All the rectangles are nothing but households and we mapped all the water sources. And then the water sources, each water source is actually feeding a small hamlet in that Gram Panchayat. So we could identify which are the hamlets where there is a water scarcity, which are the springs that are feeding them. So we prioritize the village first, then we prioritize the spring, which needs to be recharged because there is a water scarcity. And after doing this, we actually got the technical part in place. So for that, we sent our field personnel to Aquadam NGO and People Science Institute in Dehradun to understand more about geohydrology, about rock structure, how recharge areas are identified and how to monitor the spring discharge, the baseline before your project and after your project. So the focus was not on recharging the spring. That was the first mistake we made because spring is nothing but the discharge point of an aquifer which is storing the water. So just imagine you have got a plastic bottle, you prick it in different points. So the water will start coming out. Those are your springs. Each spring doesn't have an aquifer. It has a shared aquifer. The whole mountain is functioning as an aquifer. And then the springs are nothing but discharge points from a common shared aquifer. So, so for example, here you can see this is a Tendong mountain. Instead of a watershed approach, this is a geohydrology approach. You identify which are the areas where actually rainwater is actually percolating and recharging the aquifer. So you don't take up the whole 1000 hectares. You identify the recharge areas and take up only the 120 hectares. So we got support from Bhava Atomic Research Center also. They did an isotope study to help us identify these recharge areas. And they said watershed approach that you were doing is wrong. It is like a Hanuman approach. Isotope study and geohydrology studies can tell you which are the recharge areas. Normally the rocky faces will not function as recharge areas. Steep areas water will just flow away. It will not go per per percolate down. Those also cannot be recharge areas. Normally areas which have gradual slope on the saddle of the mountains where slope is less, where fractures are there, those are your recharge areas. So instead of digging your watershed trenches and ponds all over the mountain, do it only in the recharge areas. That is what we learned from science. And then we identified those areas. We dug those trenches and ponds in those recharge areas only, not in the whole watershed or in the whole catchment. And then after that, we did an assessment, a social assessment of how the households have benefited from our program. So this you see is nothing but a ridge. On the top that you see the dark green is where we did the recharge works. That is the top of the ridge. The blue dots that you see are the households whom we surveyed. The green circles that you see are the springs. So we, our assumption was people on the staying closer to the ridge, they face maximum water insecurity. So if you do these works on the top of the hill, these people who are facing insecurity, their problems will get solved. But what we found was exactly the opposite. All those villages which were next to the recharge works, they benefited the least. And it was this particular village cluster, which was quite far away from the recharge works, which benefited the most. Then again, we took the help of these experts and we came to know that this is because the dip of the rocks. So groundwater flows as per the dip of the rocks, how the rocks are aligned. Surface water flows from higher elevation to lower elevation. But groundwater, once, it, once the surface water goes underground, it flows as per the inclination of the rock. So the inclination of the rock was in the direction of, you can see this arrow. So the water that became groundwater in our recharge actually came out in this part because that is how the mountain was. The rocks in the mountain were actually inclined. And this actually gave us an idea that recharge is a very good idea, but the benefits may not be the way we want. And there is an essential inequity in the way the benefits are distributed in groundwater recharge work. So what we talk of upstream, downstream inequity that persists even in groundwater recharge. So this was a very great learning that we had. And then for the households on the upper ridge, we had no option, 
but to make these water tanks that I talked of initially as a household livelihood asset. So whatever little rainwater, roof water they had, they stored it in this 10,000 liter water tanks and they used it for two to three months when they had acute water shortage. So for the villages on the top of the hill where we had done most of our recharge works, they benefited the least. Villages which were uh, below the recharge works in the middle part, they benefited the most because that is how the mountain geology was oriented. So, uh, so we could actually do something for the ups upspring households as well. But this is how we realized by learning by doing and trying to convert science into policy and into a program. So this is the experience from trying to revive springs uh, in the Sikkim Himalaya. And uh, before our program, even large organizations like WWF, EC Mode, they when they talked of water security in the Himalaya or climate change in the Himalaya rather, their focus was mostly on glaciers. <coughs> and this study actually highlighted the point that it is the springs which ensure water security which are being impacted by climate change because as rainfall patterns become more and more disturbed, rains come in the form of torrents, the recharge becomes less, surface flow becomes more, landslide floods become more common. So the springs were getting recharged less and less, that is why they were becoming seasonal. So, so this particular study tried to emphasize the fact that if we are talking of climate change in the Himalaya, we have to focus on the springs not on the glaciers to ensure water security for the people. And this initiative was recognized by several organizations and uh, it was replicated also. And as on date, all the northeastern states, even the western Himalayan states and also the countries of Nepal and Bhutan, they have come to Sikkim to learn from this initiative. And because this problem of dying springs is all across the Himalaya, across political boundaries. So at least there is some solution that has been demonstrated that there is a chance that you can revive your springs. The most vulnerable communities on the top of the hills may not benefit as much, but you can try to create a, improve the water storage infrastructure for them. So this was the learning from this third pilot, which started from research, and then we tried to transfer it into policy and a program, understood what are the limitations and tried to adapt to it. So finally, we come to the end of this presentation and I would like to share some of the key messages or key learnings that I had uh, while embarking on this journey. So first is uh, try to produce science or knowledge together. So when, re when researchers produce science in their labs or uh, through their researchers, not engaging with the departments, not engaging with the policymakers, that research doesn't res result in societal impact. That research would result in a very good publication having very good impact, but it doesn't result in societal impact. So there is a new way of doing science now. It's known as co-production. So co-production means the users, the policy makers, scientists, managers, all of them join hands. They convene around a problem and then they understand what are the questions, how research can help in solving this problem. Together, the, the problem is identified data is collected, findings come out, and then there is a ownership. So you are strengthening the relevance of science, you are strengthening the credibility of science, you are strengthening the legitimacy because you did it in a co-production mode, everybody owns up to your research. So that is how research was done in most of these examples that I showed you. And these studies are multidisciplinary. And that we need to keep in mind, there is an ecological dimension, economic and social. So all three need to be integrated in your research if you can do that, there is a greater chance that your studies can bring about change. And even as uh, working in departments, I just wanted to share my experience. You can also spearhead and take the initiative in trying to generate evidence, generate knowledge, generate science to solve some of these pressing sustainability problems and the solution lies in partnerships. Like in the first case, for the, in the grazing case, we partnered with the local communities. And we realized that only 10% of them are herders. So that partnership actually strengthened us socially to bring about that enforcement. So it was community-led enforcement. Uh, in the second case, there was this narrative that poor people are poor because they are lazy, they are alcoholic, they don't want to change. But the study actually helped us that it is actually lack of assets, lack of livelihood assets, the reason why they are poor. And in this study, as I said, we got support from the G.B. Pand Institute of Himalayan Environment, Bill Science Institute, WWF, Aquadam, and partnerships with them helped to create knowledge jointly with us. 
and that knowledge translated into policy and into practice. So with that, I would like to end this particular talk. I hope uh, uh, you could find it interesting and uh, I am very much happy to take up questions and to answer some of the queries that you might have. Thank you so much. So please feel free to ask all your questions. Andeep. Yeah, please, please. My question is, uh, how, how much support you got from the political institution and from the other services? How you are able to generate so much of uh, interdepartmental coordination in this matter? Because all three things are so different and you are able to get, get support and you are able to achieve something. It is really a big thing to be a batchmate of yours. So I feel so proud, but how you are able to generate, whether we can replicate such kind of things in the other uh, areas also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I think uh, all our batchmates have done wonderful work. Just that few of them like me has been able to package it better and showcase it. <laughs> so what I wanted to actually highlight was uh, actually linkages are very important. And uh, I had the advantage of doing a PhD in Wildlife Institute of India, so I could understand the the universe of researchers and academicians. So that really helped in getting their support. So whenever I face some kind of a challenge in terms of knowledge, in terms of evidence, I invariably fell back on the national institutes like Wildlife Institute of India, GB Panth Institute, and there is there are good scientists in civil society organizations also, like People Science Institute, Aquadam. So I took their support to tell them that this is the problem we are facing. Can science help us in trying to give us some solutions and we generated the science together so that we owned up to the findings and their research was aligned to solving the problems that we were facing. So when research is done in problem solving mode, it creates a lot of credibility, relevance uh, and uh, acceptability amongst everyone. So I think that is the key message I wanted to share that research when done in problem solving mode it really helps all stakeholders because it results in some societal impact. So the question that you asked that how I could get those partnerships in place, a lot has to do with the relationships. So most of the partners whom who partnered in our programs, actually I had a relationship with them before that uh, particular uh, partnership happened. So most of these researchers were known to me and having worked in the academic world, they were many of them were my colleagues also. So having relationships, really helps in creating those partnerships. Uh, and then, like I said, in the first case, it was actually a very unique situation that I faced that we that the political level, they were forcing us to take up enforcement. And we were just thinking how to do it. So it was a unique kind of case, which I th I doubt if you, anyone would have faced in other, other state governments. So that was very unique. And I think partnerships is the key message I wanted to share. Typically, when we are occupying the position of let's say program implementers or policy shapers, we try to look down upon science and scientists. We feel that these people work in their own world. They are not interested in solving real life problems. So that kind of a prejudice we should not have. Many of the scientists actually want to bring about change, just that the partnerships are not there. Movement we share our challenge and we demand science. So as policy shapers and as government officers, we should also learn to demand science that this, this is the problem I am facing. The people are telling me that the springs are dying up. So I don't know why the springs are dying. Where are they dying? What is the reason? How we can recharge them? These are the questions we need to put forward to researchers and jointly come up with a solution. Even for that poverty study, uh, there was this narrative that poor people are poor because the reasons I told you, but probably we need to question that. And we got the support from some of the best social scientists in the world in that study. And we asked them these questions that this is the narrative, but we would like to know what does evidence and knowledge say? Where are the poor people? Why they are poor? Where are they located in Sikkim? What can we do for them? So if policymakers start demanding science, demanding knowledge, then academicians will also come up and jointly we can create solutions and deliver them on the ground. 
so i think that is also what i want the young minds young professionals to actually play that role of demanding science from reputed organizations and i'm sure they will come forward and support you in creating very good knowledge that you can translate to policy and practice thank you uh, so uh, good evening sir uh, so uh, related to the topics so we have like uh, research connecting research knowledge uh, and uh, po policy making and then implementing it so in my opinion if we connect this the research with the like academic research if it is connected with the industry that would be a stepping stone in connecting the policy along with the research sir in us most of the us professors they get the funding from industries and they don't look upon government primarily but uh, we have like everything we have good research institutes we have you know uh, 119 billionaires in india so we are the sixth largest economy why there is disconnect and why we are lagging behind there so that is a very good question see uh, you are talking of uh, at the industrial level i was talking more at the societal level so you are right that when it comes to funding r&d the indian uh, industries don't support the r&d to the extent that you have in the in the western counterparts and one of the reason behind that is probably because most of the technologies that we use today uh, in the country whether it is transport whether it is communication most of it is actually developed uh, in research centers which are in some of the top universities in the us and europe and then that once that science becomes a technology then it gets manufactured in the global manufacturing hubs and we start using them so you are right in that sense that the kind of investment that industry needs to make in r&d in india is much less compared to their counterparts because most of the developing uh, you can say cutting edge uh, for most of the manufacturing sector uh, whether it is uh, telecommunication whether it is electronics uh, is not really in the country and that is why most of these big brands like uh, apple or samsung or others uh, they develop their research and their r&d centers are mostly outside but some of them have started manufacturing in india now some of the research hubs have also started coming but what i really wanted to highlight was in the universe of a developmental program so while we think of r and d typically in terms of scientists working in labs we also need to understand that natural resource science social science economic science are also very relevant in our day to day lives and when you work as at the at level of program managers or policy shapers we need to also demand science whether it is social science economic science ecological science we need to demand Uh, why people are poor where are they located what can we do for them why the springs are drying up what is the rate of decline can their decline be stopped so we need to ask those questions and there are very reputed organizations in india national institutes are there who can actually support you in solving that problem and creating a knowledge that is co-produced and that research is in problem solving mode so it is really something that will be really useful and it can be translated into policy and practice so let's not look at research only which is created in a lab uh, research can also be a societal research it can also be about economics economic sciences it can be also about forest ecology so we need to think at it a bit broadly the way we look at research i hope that answers your question so could you give Thank some you. so could you give some thumb rules as to decide about the credibility of a scientific research that we might be looking at you have pointed to the reputation of institutions as one of the markers i ask this because in a world there is in a world where there is huge rush to publish scientific papers as well and there are certain thorny issues for example the case of eucalyptus plantations where the jury is still out and we hear diverse uh perspective so what are some of the thumb rules that may help us to decide on the credibility of scientific research okay very good very good question so i guess credibility is very important you need to partner with the right organization with the right people who also share your passion for solving problems on the ground so i guess we need to be more open as a development practitioners and have these partnerships outside our domain so we need to have partnership with researchers and with civil society organizations the bigger your network the more you will be aware who is doing what so if uh, you talk to me that if suppose there is a himalayan black bear 
uh, human wildlife conflict in Sikkim. So I know that there is Professor Satya Kumar in Wildlife Institute of India who is a national expert. He is an international expert in Himalayan black bear. If you tell me that groundwater resources in the Himalaya, so I know that Dr. GCS Negi, uh, Dr. Varun Joshi in Jivipan Institute, they have done a lot of work in this field. So I guess there are these national experts who are doing very good work. For social sciences, rural livelihoods, IRMA is there, Tata Institute of Social Sciences is there. Uh, so there are these national institutes which are doing tremendous work. Just that we don't get an interface. Like I said, academicians live in their own world, policy makers live in their own world, practitioners live in their own world. There is very little intersection. So the biggest uh, USP of uh, forest officers that I see is that we come from a science background. So we have that orientation towards science and we are working also at the level of shaping policy and implementing developmental and conservation programs. So we can play that role of connecting these three universes. And we can do that by forging partnerships with academic organizations, with civil society organizations and create a bigger impact. And we should not forget that typically we feel that the best scientists will be in government organizations. Best scientists can also be in civil society organizations like ATRI is there uh, in Bangalore, NCF is there in Mysore, uh, People Science Institute is there in Dehradun. So we need to look at the expertise that you want. So uh, when it came to reviving springs, GB Pan Institute was there along with that Aquadime organization was there in Pune, which was doing tremendous work in groundwater recharge. People Science Institute was there. They were doing tremendous work. Chirag NGO was there in Uttarakhand. They were doing some work. So we partnered with them. So knowledge can come from national institutes. It can come from civil society organizations also. It can come from some researchers who are who have international repute. Just that we need to partner with them. Tell them, sir, this is the problem we are facing. Can you partner with us? Let's try to solve it together. Once we do that, there is a lot of synergy and you get a totally different perspective. So why I wanted to highlight that was, like I said earlier, most of the simple problems my generation has solved. So the ones that are remaining are the complex ones which have multiple dimensions. They will need intersectoral approach. They will need partnerships. And to solve these complex sustainability problems, we need to be open. We should not be biased beforehand that these scientists, they don't do anything. They only publish papers. They are least worried about bringing about some change. If you have a biased opinion like that, it will prevent you from doing partnerships. So my suggestion is be positive, be optimistic and partner with the most credible, the most reputed national experts, whether they are in government institutions or in civil society organizations. And I'm sure you will see the amount of value they can add in your program. Yeah, thank you. Sir, I have one question. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, yeah, yes. Sir, here we are talking about science and bringing it to the policy and we have talked about a lot of sciences being done in the laboratories and by the scientists. But sir, there are a lot of science and traditional knowledge which is there at the rural area and with the tribal people. And that knowledge and that science is not being recognized and especially when we bureaucrats go to the ground, that is like very less documented. But if that knowledge is documented and recognized, because that knowledge and that science has been researched over hundred or uh, thousand of years and has been purified. If, how can we document that thing and bring it to the policy level so that it can go from one place to the other place and benefit to the people at the large as well as be the bureaucrat also, bureaucrats also? A very good question, huh? very good question. So in my experience also, I have seen that there is lot, so much of community knowledge uh, which you can use in decision making. So the whole purpose of creating this eco-development committee, joint forest management committees is that to open that channel of communication between the community and between the government. And that helps us to actually understand their perspective of the issue before we put forward ours. And this kind of research, so the research I talked of was mostly interdisciplinary. We talk of different dimensions. When you bring in the local community and the indigenous knowledge, it is known as transdisciplinary uh, science. So if we can graduate from disciplinary science to interdisciplinary science and from there to transdisciplinary science, wherein we involve the local community, their indigenous knowledge, 
that is the best solution so i haven't reached that level so i am only at the level of interdisciplinary science but if you can reach that transdisciplinary science it is like achieving nirvana if you ask me because then all stakeholders their knowledge is getting embedded in your decision making it is like a manthan that is happening and if you can get the best scientific knowledge best traditional knowledge and get some practitioners also then you will be able to create solutions even for the most challenging problems so that i think is a very good idea and the whole purpose of partnering with the communities and forming these self help groups joint forest management committees watershed committees is to get that communication going their understanding their perceptions their perspectives and yours thank you good evening sir good evening sir i have a question like uh, under quill framework uh, how do we measure the relevance period for a particular research like uh, in to today's research how far it will be uh, useful in the future times like today world is changing very fast yeah that's a very good question so actually what we need to look at as researchers no if i am working in let's say a uh, academic institution i would like to actually look at my research as relevant if it is helping to solve some field problem so i will link the relevance of my research to its ability of solving some field based problem so i'll be communicating with my various batchmates and friends all across the country and i will ask them is there any problem that you are facing which requires scientific inputs see all problems don't need scientific input some problems can be solved just by giving additional funding some by giving additional staffing some by just reorienting the program some by changing the policy but some programs require science and wherever i get that demand from the field uh, practitioners that this is one challenge i am facing the springs are dying i don't know how to revive them uh, people are saying that poor people are poor because they are lazy but i would like to understand what is the reason why people are some people are poor in the same village others are not uh, so when you try to align your science with some demand that comes from a policy maker or a practitioner that is that science i would classify as the most relevant and if you align that science with some national policy like in the case of uh, the experiment that we did in rural livelihoods we aligned that policy with mission poverty free sikkim we said that if we have to make sikkim poverty free we need to understand the determinants of poverty we need to understand what is it that is the geographical location of the poor people what we can do for them so if you align your study with some state or national policies that is also one way of making your science relevant thank you sir sir i have one more question yeah yeah uh, during this uh, manrega case how did you manage the other people in the village who didn't get benefited from uh, your scheme initiatives very good question very good question this was the difficulty we faced so we need to understand that when you are bringing in some policy change there are certain power equations which you will try to alter and the people who, some people will benefit but some will lose out so when we shifted from those large infrastructure projects to micro household level assets the gram panchayats many of them were unhappy they said sir only through this large projects like footpaths and playgrounds and drainage works we can showcase the achievements of my time to the people when the next elections come when the next elections comes i can tell them dekho mere time mein ye sadak bani thi mere time mein ye playground bana tha i can showcase it much better but when you make these small 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 assets you focus only on the poor people then there are so many others who ask me that we also voted for you so why you are giving the benefits only to the poor people so that was the challenge they faced so uh, initially we were planning to earmark 100% of manrega funds for these household livelihood assets for the poor people so once we did that consultation with the gram panchayats they said sir but you need to understand that we also have to fight for the next elections and win the next elections and we can do that only if we can showcase some large projects so then we came to a compromise saying that okay 50% of the funds we will use for household livelihood assets remaining 50% you can use for the infrastructure projects which are also useful you need connectivity you need playgrounds for the children so that is how we try to balance it so you are right in saying that 
uh, whenever you bring about a policy try to implement it in a pilot manner like one suggestion i got so we did this pilot first and in those gram panchayats they told us sir that if you only work if we work only for the poor we will all lose the next election so we said okay let's come up with a middle solution we keep 50% for large projects 50% but has to be earmarked for the poorest and the reason why they listened to us was we made our policy relevant how did we make it relevant we told them see this is a chief minister's policy we need to make sikkim poverty free in the next 10 years how is it possible just by making this large projects we need to diversify the livelihoods of the poor people so that is how we try to influence the panchayats to agree to a middle path so that is how we could ground that policy and also make it acceptable to the gram panchayats because we increase the relevance of that particular policy by aligning it with mission poverty free sikkim and the gram panchayats cannot counter a state policy that has come from the chief minister so that is why they agreed to this middle path that was a very good question thank you for that thank you sir anyone else please feel free thank you sandeep sir uh, i think there is one more question sir sure 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 sir Uh, I have a question, sir. So you spoke mostly about that, uh, which was willing to work with you or uh, willing to work with your ideas. Uh, so, so uh, I guess generally that will not be the case that all the all the way uh, that political will will be supportive to the government officers. Right, sir. Uh, so, what do you think that how far your uh, bringing science to the policy would have been worth if uh, the local politicians were not in favor? Uh, or your ideas and what are the ways you would have uh, uh, used uh, in order to convince the uh, political will uh, that bringing science to the policy uh, will certainly benefit both society as well as the uh, politicians thanks okay very good question now so how can we actually generate political will to support the actions that we want to take is that your question or how can we influence politicians to back whatever changes we are proposing is that your question uh, right sir how okay. can we convince your policy bringing science to the policy okay yeah so yeah, yeah, i got it yeah so in the uh, in the first case like i said in the grazing case the 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 policy makers made the policy and they made us implement it so in that case there was no need to actually convince them in the second case actually when we talked about the poverty uh, and ensuring that sizable funds are earmarked for the poor people we actually made a presentation so before that like i said the narrative was very different uh, there was no scientific study in the state that actually did an assessment of the determinants of poverty the geographical distribution of poverty and the asset base of the poor people so actually when you do these studies and you get these national experts they present their study before policy makers they help in bringing about that change if i as a bureaucrat would have done the study and presented it it would not have been looked upon as something very credible but the study was done by some of the best national and international experts and they presented it to the policy makers and that resulted in change so i think that is very important that who is presenting what is the legitimacy of that organization of that particular academician so if you get some of the best scientists in the country if you can uh, partner with them and they are just waiting for opportunity from policy makers because they also want to create societal impact they also want to work in a problem solving mode to bring about some change so if you can do those partnerships and those top scientists and academicians when they present before the policy makers of the state there is a greater chance that some change will come so there is no doubt about that so the springs program as well we got people science institute and we got gb panth and they were the ones who made the presentation and it helped in finding out the reason why the springs are dying what we can do for them so those questions we were not able to answer as a department because we are not actually a research organization but just wanted to highlight the role that science can play in the role in the uh, in simplifying the role that we have as a bureaucrats
thank you sandeep sir for such a wonderful and insightful session and the interactions afterwards now i request our director ignfa bharat jyoti sir to felicitate dr sandeep tambe uh, as a, a token of gratitude with an online uh, momento <laughs> थैंक यू सर नाउ आई रिक्वेस्ट श्री कृष्ण चंद्र शेखर ऑफिसर ट्रेनी थर्टी फिफ्थ एस एफ एस टू फॉर्मली प्रेजेंट वोट ऑफ थैंक्स थैंक यू respected director ignf shri bharat jyoti sir respected guest speaker shri sandeep tambe sir respected dg icfre shri arun singh rawat sir respected director wia dr sp yadav sir respected ig forest rt division moefcc dr sunish bakshi sir and other senior officials of moefcc director fri dr renu singh ma'am and heads of other organizations under icfre umbrella uh, respected dean fri dim to be university dr h s jinwal sir respected dg fsi sri anup singh sir respected regional office head moefcc sri pankaj agarwal sir respected faculty members of ignfa dehradun respected director forest education sri anurag bharadwaj sir respected principal cash flows dehradun mrs minakshi joshi ma'am respected principal cash flows coimbatore v thiru navu karau sir respected faculty members of cash flows uh, professionals of ifs 2021-23 batch uh, 35th and 36th fss indu uh, induction trainee of dehradun 20 Eight SFS induction trainees of QM2 and fourteenth FRO trainees of QM2. A very good afternoon to all of you. First and foremost, I would like to offer a thank to our guest speaker, Sri Sandeep Tambe sir, who has eloquently articulated the topic of science policy practice interface and illustrated it aptly with. case studies on sustainable pastoral management restructuring of manrega for its effective implementation and spring reju rejuvenation uh, sir you also highlighted uh, pertinent issues like linkage of science research uh, with policy and their practical implementation uh, multidisciplinary nature of uh, research uh, along with uh, participatory approach along of uh, with community Uh, for tackling today's complex issues like uh, sustainability challenges uh, sir once again i would like to uh, thank you for uh, highlighting this issue which which will be relevant for today's policy formulator and implementer li i would also like to thank director ignfa sri bharat jyoti sir dg icfre sri arun singh rawat sir director wia sri sp yadav sir and all other dignitaries present here for their gracious presence and without which this event would not have been possible last but not least i would also like to thank each and every one who has helped in the successful organization of this lecture by ignfa as a part of ajali ka amrit mahotsav celebration thank you i would also like to take this opportunity of thanking ignfa for giving me this opportunity to share uh, my uh, career journey with some of the young minds and also engaging with them thank you so much sir thank you, thank you.